Hello, listeners, and welcome to another episode of Cognitive Dissidence. As usual, I'm your host. I'm Jacob Shapiro. I'm a partner and the director of geopolitical analysis at Cognitive Investments. Joining me on the podcast for the second time is Stephen Nagy. He's a professor at the International Christian University in Tokyo, Japan. Uh, Stephen is Canadian originally, but he has been based in Asia for decades, has been in Japan for over two decades. Um, really excited to bring him back on and for him to give his perspective about Japan. Uh, we recorded this on Friday, August 18th. This uh, episode will publish in about two weeks. It's one of the episodes that I'm backloading for while I'm out of the country uh, and not able to record. So I hope you enjoy it. Uh, most of it will be right up and, and relevant, although there may be some developments around Japan and South Korea that will have happened between now and then. But you can follow me on Twitter or follow CI if you want access to those developments. Um, otherwise, Email me at jacob at cognitive.investments if you want to talk about our asset management services, if you want to talk about us managing your money, if you want to talk about our research and consulting, uh, or if you have suggestions about Japanese guests that would come on the podcast, I'd appreciate those too. You can also send me whatever's on top of your mind. So cheers and see you out there. Cognitive Investments LLC is a registered investment advisor. Advisory services are only offered to clients or prospective clients where Cognitive and its representatives are properly licensed or exempt from licensure. For additional information, please visit our website at www.cognitive.investments. The information provided is for educational and informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice and it should not be relied on as such. It should not be considered a solicitation to buy or an offer to sell a security that does not take into account any investor's particular investment objectives, strategies, tax status, or investment horizon. You should consult your attorney or tax advisor. Stephen, I can't believe it's years since we had you back on. Um, how about you just give your your title for the listeners so they know who you are and where you're coming from? Sir Jacob, I'm a professor at the International Christian University and a visiting fellow at the Japan International uh, Institute for International Affairs, amongst others. And how, how long have you been based in Japan? It's been decades, hasn't it? Uh, uh, all in all in Asia, 26 years, five years in Hong Kong and 21 years in Japan at two different stages. So, uh, that part of the world is home. Is, is Japan home for you? Does that, does it feel like home? You know, Japan's really comfortable. I, I love it there. Great food. It's safe. It's predictable. Uh, aesthetically, you know, the arts are, are amazing. And, uh, you know, despite it being somewhat stagnant, it's also constantly changing. And that's, again, the contradiction of being in Japan. Um, it's become such a critical part of geopolitics within the region, U.S. engagement within the region, um, that uh, it's exciting, especially if you're in the field of international affairs. Well, that's absolutely true. But I feel like one of the things that is going to have to change here for Japan in the next couple of years is that they're going to have to welcome in foreigners in a way that they never have before. Either that or they're going to have to really perfect robots and AI uh, much quicker than anybody else would give them credit for. And I noticed, um, uh, you know, everybody talks about the Japan demographic data, and we can talk about that. I feel like that's fairly common knowledge. But I noticed in the latest demographic report from Japan, they talked about how the foreign-born population had actually increased something like 10 or 11% year on year. And it's from a fairly small base. So, But it's still like 10, over 10% rise in that is, is pretty interesting. So I was... I was wondering if if you feel like someone with your background, a Canadian white dude from Canada, can ever actually feel at home in Japan. Do you can you imagine a world in which you do feel at home in Japan, or do you always feel you know a little bit set aside, a little bit like you're you're watching a culture that you'll never be fully accepted into? So I, I think that um, I accept that I'm never going to be fully accepted into Japan. Just um, you know, I'm physically different. Uh, my Japanese is is really really good, but you know, it's not at a native level. Um, and the fact that I have a different cultural perspective as I think about things. So um, is that important to me? Not really. Um, but I do think uh, I'm not the representative foreigner in Japan. I think that you need to look at um, the ethnic Chinese there, the ethnic Koreans there, the growing number of Vietnamese and Filipinos that are there that blend in much more. Um, they didn't tend to marry Japanese people. Uh, they take on uh, more Japanese behavior. And, you know, they are more representative, I think, of the uh, foreign community that's emerging in Japan. And, um, you know, we need to pay much more attention to these uh, individuals because uh, many naturalize. Uh, they uh, go into the Japanese education system. They go into the Japanese uh, university system. And, you know, by and large, they are uh, negotiating Japanese society as, as Japanese citizens. And in many cases, you know, um, 
they are they do very very well and i think that we need to pay attention to this growing group of of uh, migrants and i use the word migrant rather than immigrant because i think um, many still retain their home nationality but there's increasing incentive to take on japanese nationality and in that case they're going to start to change the fabric of japanese society another interesting element is you go to places like uh, Aichi Prefecture or uh, Guma Prefecture, you'll go to towns and cities where 30% of the population uh, come from Brazil or come from uh, other parts mm. of the world. And, you know, they bring with them their culture, their families, their schooling, their interest in language. Uh, and you see a lot more of a multicultural context in those communities. So it's changing slowly, um, but parts of the country you would you would think you're in a different country because of the number of, of migrants that actually exist. And I guess on another level, Japan is very open at the high skill level and the low skill level to migrants. Uh, and it's not so open to the middle class. And that will take more time uh, to fill uh, that part of Japanese society, which is the largest group of, of, of individuals in society. And, and until we see you know, immigrants or migrants in the middle class, uh, I don't think we're going to see the transformative, um, or see Japan transform in terms of its, you know, its ethnic diversity. Yeah. Um, I wanted to focus on something you've already said, which is Japan is, it's it's both changing and it's stagnant. I, I feel like it's it's almost banal to say that Japan is a land of contradictions, but it's, it's, uh, it's sort of a truism as well. They can be stagnant and changing at the same time. They can have the oldest demographics in the world. And like you said, if you look a little bit deeper underneath, uh, things can be changing in a major way. And Japanese history is one of rapid leaps, you know, in response to different either external stimuli or internal developments where what seemed impossible a couple of years suddenly is possible and Japan sort of completely changes. So I wanted to ask, um, you know, you were telling me before we hit the record button here, and I basically wanted you to run it back for the listeners, you know, talking about some of the changes you've seen in the countryside and some of the Japanese cities. Can you talk about some of the change that you're seeing um, in Japan? And then after we talk about the change, maybe we'll go back into what has been stagnant and what is not changing. Well, I think the countryside is a great place to start. And if you go to uh, the mountain regions such as Nagano or um, Yamanashi, or, what you'll see is um, non-traditional uh, I guess migrants coming, in particular Australians and New Zealanders, and they're setting up businesses, restaurants. Um, they're uh, really the uh, the workers that are welcoming foreign tourists to these uh, regional towns, and it's really, really stunning. Uh, these people are setting up their lives, and they're welcomed by the local communities because they're bringing in, uh, you know, capital. They're investing in the local communities, and they're fundamentally changing. Um, how these rural communities are, are managing. And then you'll go to other communities where you're seeing uh, the mechanization of farming. Uh, the reality is, is the average farmer's age is 70, 73. Um, they just can't keep, they can't keep it up in many ways. And uh, as a result, they need to, um, to work with tools and, and, and work within uh, a more mechanicized uh, farming community so they can actually deal with the challenges of maintaining the, the, the farming community. And if you go to the places up in, um, it's Yamanashi, or, uh, Yamagata Prefecture, they have uh, a town called Ogata Mura. And basically what the Japanese government did maybe 40 years ago is they brought in the top farmers from around the country and set up a town and set up this large rice producing uh, village. And it produces a huge amount of rice for the country, and it's all it's all done with machines. It's all done with uh, Japanese technology, and it's a good example of how they transformed a, a rural community. And then you have other communities that are struggling. Uh, quite frankly, the aging population has made it difficult for them to sustain their uh, infrastructure to sustain their communities. And we see uh, the merger of towns and 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 villages so that they can address some of these. Uh, issues. And then other cities or towns are blessed with um, natural resources or uh, tourist sites such as Beppu, and, and they have a huge inflow flow of tourists that keep the economy going. Um, so there's a lot of variety out there. Um, and when you start traveling through the country, you see that um, different parts of the country are managing the demographic decline very differently. 
uh, and um, they need to you know exchange more information about how to manage what's happening to the rural community. Um, what so that that's sort of an example of of change, but you've also sort of led the way towards stagnation. And Rob and I have talked in some of our conversations here about um, you know Japan has had it's not even fair to call it a lost decade. I mean, we're talking about lost decades. Everybody's talking about China and the, the bad economic news out of China. We will get to China in a little bit. But yeah, Japan is the is the OG here. They've been having this um, disappointing performance for literally decades. Um, and on the one hand, maybe you're starting to see some change. On the other hand, you know, every every 6% <laughs> like GDP growth figure, then it's like, oh, but real wages aren't keeping up with inflation. And Are they really actually hitting their inflation targets and things like that? So where is the stagnation that you're talking about? You've, you've given us a vivid picture of change, but what um what is that stagnation that you're seeing? So I think um, stagnation can be seen in a bunch of different areas in the Japanese context. And one is I think the education system is stagnated. Uh, they're still mm-hmm. producing citizens that are basically for an industrial economy. Um, in the post World War II period, they had to create an, uh, an education system which created literate, numerate individuals that could be inserted into businesses, inserted into the, uh, the government to manage uh, reconstruction and the rapidly industrialized economy. Um, but today, uh, really since the 1990s, we've, Japan's needed a completely different education system, one that focuses on critical thinking, languages, communication, networking. Um, that are accustomed to horizontal and vertical um, mobility within businesses uh, to create a mindset uh, in students about the necessity of lifelong learning. And I think here um, education is stagnant. It's not keeping up with the 21st century needs. And, you know, you contrast to uh, education systems in other countries uh, and it's stark. The contrast is stark. Um, I think uh, what contributes to this uh, is, you know, the fact that this lifetime employment is uh, embedded in the mindset of Japanese society and workers. um, Much of their life cycle is related to uh, being able to get that permanent job and expected expected wage increases over a lifetime. Uh, And the fact that you can't get fired. Um, But this decreases the risk level of ordinary citizens. It it pushes them to choose uh, very conservative paths in terms of education, in terms of jobs, in terms of marriage, where they live. Uh, And again, this all contributes to the stagnation that I mentioned. Um, We see the stagnation in the public service. Uh, Japan still is far behind in terms of digitizing the um, uh, public service. Uh, and just to give you an example, I was driving with my friend here in Calgary the other day, and we hit a deer, and we called the RCMP, and the RCMP said, I'll email you the documents, and you could just send me back the documents. But if this happened in Japan, you know, somebody with their slippers at the local government would walk up with seven pieces of paper that you'd have to sign, and you'd have to show five or six pieces of ID to demonstrate you're who you are. And I think, again, this is representative of the stagnation that um, is abound in aspects of Japan. But I, I want to say that um, the stagnation, again, comes with a very innovative and uh, change in Japan. And I think that's an important side for your listeners to also think about. And the biggest area, of course, is foreign policy. Um, 20 years ago, we were laughing about rotating prime ministers and who would be the prime minister next month. Uh, the the lack of direction in foreign policy. And then Mr. Abe came into power uh, on a, during his second prime ministership and introduced this I- idea of a free and open Indo-Pacific vision. And we saw the Japanese take a leadership role in shaping the foreign policies of many countries, quite frankly. Um, today, the United States, Australia, Canada, India, ASEAN, Europe, Germany, France, uh, the UK, uh, South Korea, all have Indo-Pacific strategies, which were modeled on uh, Prime Minister Abe's vision for um, institutionalizing, creating shared norms within the Indo-Pacific to shape China's external environment to hopefully shape some of its behavior. And I think this is a good example of leadership. Um, economic security is another area. 
that was a term that emerged out of Japan, and now it has become lingua franca for many countries. Uh, supply chain resilience as well. Um, selective diversification away from China. Um, that doesn't mean decoupling. Uh, the Japanese clearly want to be part of the, Jap- the Chinese economy by making in China uh, with Chinese labor for Chinese, but with Japanese technology. So the stagnation also comes with, I think, innovation and leadership. Um, and uh, I think it's important to get a big picture of where Japan is going, not just fo- focusing on the stagnation or the demographic issues that they're facing. Yeah. Um, that's a great segue into talking about Japanese foreign policy, and I want to hit all the topics that you just mentioned, plus a few others. Um, but let's start with China, because China is the dragon in the room. It's it's the most important one, and the extent to which the Japanese economy is integrated with the Chinese economy. I mean, it's not realistic for it's not that realistic for the United States to decouple either. But for Japan, it's even more so. I mean, that would just be a disaster if they actually tried to take the approach that U.S. is that the U.S. is. And this goes back, I think, also to contradiction with Japan. Japan is more comfortable with contradiction. They are more comfortable with having both a rival and an economic partner than maybe the United States is, which has always been uh, very black and white. And I'm I'm glad you brought up that um, vocabulary about, you know, sort of selective diversification versus decoupling, because you're exactly right. Japanese companies are not giving up on the Chinese market. Um, at all. What what they're trying to do is, all right, we will have supply chains that feed into China because that's a market of a billion people and we have a lot of history there. We can't just turn our backs on it. But if the international political climate is going to turn against China in that way, we also need to have you know factories in Vietnam or make sure that Taiwan stays independent, sort of all these other things. And I don't think people quite understand this or see how forward thinking Japanese companies are with supply chain risk because I've experienced talking to lots of U.S. companies. They really don't see it that way. It's more, well, am I in China or not? Do I go China or do I move everything to Mexico? So maybe talk a little bit about Japan's relationship with China and about how, you know, Abe is a great example. Abe could articulate this vision of a free Indo-Pacific and and talk about a more muscular, a more militarized Japan. At the same time, he was relatively friendly with Xi Jinping and talked about the importance of having good japan china relations uh, they were arguably never better than under you know abe with some exceptions here and there so talk about japan's approach to china and whether you think that approach can survive the continued deterioration of ties between china and japan's most important security partner the united states so a really good example of this is when i attend closed door discussions between japanese and american counterparts Our american counterparts talk about all the problems the security challenges with china and you know basically you know, China's a threat, we got to deal with it. And the Japanese respond by saying, well, last year we traded $391 billion of trade with China. The trade relationship is by and large equal, meaning we sell and buy about the same amount. In the previous year, it was about $371 billion. And this is despite the record unfavorable ratings of China in Japan, uh, despite the COVID-19 pandemic, and despite the increasingly Uh, severe um, security challenges that uh, Japan faces. And I think that this is a very good starting point. Um, Japan benefits very much from this relationship. And we've seen the number of small, medium-sized enterprises in China continue to increase. Uh, I think the latest number I saw was 37,000 SMEs uh, in China. Uh, The Japanese uh, see it as the most important economic uh, partnership for a sustainable uh, uh, Japanese economy. Uh, as you mentioned, there's going to be at least five, six hundred million uh, middle class Chinese consumers that Japan wants to sell their goods to. So this relationship is deep, it's broad, um, but it's not um, asymmetric. Um, and this is a really important distinction. I think we often think that China is in the driving seat of this relationship. But in fact, both countries um, have asymmetric advantages over each other um, in in a sense that uh, Japan has the technology, it has the experience, um, you know, it really is, uh, you know, dominating in many niche markets that the, Ch- the Chinese absolutely need to keep their economic machine going. And we saw this back in uh, March um, 2011. Uh, when the big tsunami and earthquake hit uh, Japan. It disrupted a lot of the small businesses and the logistic pathways in northeastern Japan. 
And as a result, those businesses couldn't get all of these very, very specialized parts to the factories in China. Uh, and we saw a slowdown. And the Chinese tried to make up for the uh, inability to get a hold of these products by going to Korea, but they couldn't get their hands on the same kinds of products at the same quality. And it demonstrates that the Japanese really have a key role in ensuring that the Chinese production network continues uh, apace. Um, the Japanese are also involved in employing hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of Chinese citizens. And in an economy that has rapidly uh, slowed down from a peak in 2007 of about 15% GDP a year to today, we don't know what the Chinese GDP is, but it certainly isn't 5%. Yeah. Um, right now, the you know, youth unemployment may be 25 or 30%. Uh, the housing market is, is it's, I think, 30 35% down since last year, the Japan and Japanese footprint really, really is an important uh, uh, part of the Chinese economy in terms of keeping people employed. And of course, employment comes with training and other aspects of economic engagement. Uh, so the Chinese need the Japanese, but the, Chi the Chi Japanese need those Chinese consumers as well. So this is what I'm saying, that the relationship is... Um, not a, a one-way relationship. They benefit from each other. And I think this this is what moderates both countries' behaviors towards each other. Um, if there wasn't that economic dependency on both sides, we might see the relationship actually uh, move more towards a kinetic uh, conflict on core areas. That's all well and good, but so let's let's take that to tangible examples. So, w for example, right now we're recording on Friday, August eighteenth. We will probably put this out in in a week or two. I'm I'm going to be gone for at the end of the month, so I'm I'm stacking some episodes at the end of the month, and hopefully nothing will have happened between now and then with this. But big news of the day in the South China Sea is what's going on with the Philippines and China, with you know Chinese coast guard ships firing water cannons at Philippine ships near some of these uninhabited shoals and things like that. The Philippines saying, well, this might be a declaration of war already. The United States saying it's going to defend the Philippines in any circumstance. Now, what would Japan do um, in 2023 that it did or didn't do in, say, 2012 when we had the Scarborough Shoal incident? Or if you, and I'm not one of these people who thinks that a Chinese invasion of Taiwan is imminent. If anything, I think it's many years down the road if it ever comes. I don't think that that's what China really wants. But let's let's give the scenario that let's say China does do something with Taiwan. Maybe it's a Taiwan Straits crisis type event, or maybe they try to seize some islands, maybe they go for the whole thing. You know, what does Japan do in that sort of situation? Because, you know, pragmatism and economic benefit and all these other things, they can get you, you know, a long way, but there are some key issues where, you know, Japan probably can't have it both ways. It's probably going to have to choose one or the other. Or, or am I guilty of being the simpleton American who's, who's making it a black and white decision? So I think the Philippine case and Southeast Asian countries and the Taiwan case is slightly different. So let's start in Southeast Asia, because I think this is really um, a good place to look at Japan's nuanced diplomacy. And what it continually, continuously pri prioritizes is building the um, domestic capabilities of Southeast Asian countries so that they can be better placed to monitor uh, Chinese activities and to create... Uh, some deterrence capabilities. And what they do is they provide Coast Guard vessels, they provide training, um, they bring in public servants from those countries to come and study in Japan and build strong relationships. So their view is that these strategic partnerships are about capability building, not necessarily joint security operations to push back against the Chinese. And I don't say we're going to go that way. Um, one, because the Southeast Asian counterparts don't want that. And two, uh, Japan's not willing to go that far. That's that's not the priority theater for the the uh, Japanese outside sea lines of communication. Now, the Taiwan question is really different, and I think when we think about the Taiwan question, it's useful to think about it through the lens of sea lines of communication. It's useful to think about um, Taiwan's strategic position in the first island chain, and it's useful to think about tai uh, Taiwan's position in the technology uh, supply chain. So, in terms of the sea lines of communication, uh, about five point five trillion dollars of U.S. Uh, U.S. USD goes through the South China Sea up and around the Taiwan Straits annually. That's a significant uh, amount of change, and a lot of that goes to Japan. Uh, and they understand clearly that uh, China dominating Taiwan or fundamental uh, uh, 
engaging in a kinetic conflict with Taiwan would disrupt sea lines of communication. It would disrupt uh, energy inputs into the country, uh, and it would fundamentally affect Japan's economic security. So this is a high priority for Japan, and this is why we see Japan continue to talk about peace and stability across the Taiwan Straits. The second area I mentioned was the first island chain. So um, basically from Hokkaido to the main islands of Japan, Okinawa, Taiwan to the Philippines. This is seen as kind of a, a, a natural barrier to hem in the Chinese to ensure that they can't move freely into the Pacific and project power. And Japan is worried about what that means if the Chinese can move freely in and out of the first island chain. And could they engage in a blockade that could affect the Japanese economy? And it goes back to sea lines of communication. Um, lastly, and I think uh, importantly, is the technology side. Still, Taiwan places uh, is is you know the the mecca of first tier uh, semiconductors. The Taiwanese semiconductor manufacturing country uh, company is based there, um, and we don't see the kind of diversification away from China and Taiwan uh, to ensure that semiconductor supplies remain stable and intact. And I think it's important for us to understand. What, what, where those semiconductors go? Uh, they go into cars, they go into phones, they go into iPads, they go into uh, planes, they go into jets. And many of Japan's signature products are fall into these categories. So they see a huge risk associated with um, uh, a disruption in supply chains. And you probably noticed I didn't say anything about democracy. You probably noticed I didn't say anything about you know the friendship between the Taiwanese and the, and the Japanese because I think they're really looking at this through um, um, an interest-based analysis, uh, which makes sense. So as the Ch- Japanese are looking at Taiwan, they're thinking about how can they maintain the current status quo, ensure those sea lines of communication remain free, ensure that uh, semiconductor uh, production remains uh, safe and stable, and that the first sign of change doesn't fall into uh an assertive authoritarian China that is really, uh, through its track record, de- track record demonstrated, wants to change the regional security architecture. Um, so is it willing to fight for Taiwan? I really think it depends on the scenario. If the Chinese decide to uh, form a blockade around Taiwan, I would not bet on the Japanese uh, stepping up to break the blockade alongside its U.S. partner. Uh, if the Taiwanese declare independence unilaterally, I wouldn't expect them to um, step up to the plate. Um, If the Chinese attacked uh, unilaterally to try and force uh, reunification, this is a very different scenario, and I think that they would probably jump in alongside the United States, uh, Australia, and perhaps other countries to repel this kind of uh, action. Uh, I don't think it's good. I don't, unlike you, I don't think it's on, on the table. Um, and I don't think that the possibility of a forced uh, reunification is, is very low. Um, but I think that is the scenario that the Japanese would have to be involved in. I don't think they could um, remove themselves from uh, from that kind of contingency. But the other contingencies, I think that they you, you might be disappointed if you're betting on Japan. Hmm. Um, how do you rate the... The strength of the Japanese Navy versus the Chinese Navy. I would rate it fairly high for now, but I mean, China is modernizing and also, I mean, quantity has a quality all of its own, as we like to say on the podcast in lots of different contexts. So, um, you know, I, I think if we were just maybe taking a snapshot here today, my sense as well, Japan probably is more technologically advanced, maybe more skillful, more experienced today, how long that holds, whether their threat of deterrence can actually hold for any long amount of time to defend these sea lines of communication that you're talking about. How, how do you rate the the military force and balance between them? Well, here I think that there is the, the quantity versus quality side, that um, dimension that you mentioned, but there's also the experience side. Uh, and I think lastly is um, where Japan fits within um, uh, alliances and networks and security communities. So in terms of quantity versus quality, I think the, the Chinese are all, already way ahead in terms of qu- uh, quantity, and that will continue to be the case. Um, they produce, I think, the French fleet every year, and uh, this, is, this isn't this is going to change. Um, but in terms of quality, um, there's real questions of where the Chinese sit in terms of quality of their, their navy. And that is linked to my next point is experience. Uh, you need to be able to deploy and um, uh, develop those technologies and those abilities to project power and to defend um, 
in different scenarios. And what we've seen is the Japanese, whether it's pre-war, they had expensive, ex- extensive experience in terms of using their naval platform to project power. Uh, in the post-World War II period, they've worked with the United States in many different areas to uh, refine the kinds of capabilities that they need to defend themselves. Uh, and at first was mostly in and around the islands of Japan, but it's expanded in terms of refueling operations in the Indian Ocean during the uh, Afghan conflict. Um, they had engaged in uh, anti-mining activities in the Persian Gulf. Um, they have uh, found other opportunities to refine their capabilities, uh, which give them a certain quality that I think the Chinese are not there yet. Um, the last point I want to mention is um, those alliances and net- security networks that Japan is part of. Of course, uh, it only has one alliance partners, that's the United States, um, but it's developed a reciprocal access agreement between Australia and, the United, uh, Australia and Japan, UK and Japan. Uh, if you're following the Camp David uh, discussions today, uh, which are taking place, it looks like they will be the Camp David principles where the South Koreans and the Japanese and the United States will have military exercises every year. They'll have um, regular meetings uh, that they will deepen their cooperation in many areas except for uh, nuclear cooperation. Um, so I see that Japan is woven into many different security architectures that, again, provide it uh, a different qualitative um, uh, nature, but also how it can work synergistically with other navies to enhance its capabilities. And here, um, I just don't think China's there. Uh, I, I do realize that the, the Russians and the Chinese last month you know, circumvented or did some exercises in the Sea of Japan. Um, but uh, qualitatively, the uh, interaction between the Russians and the Chinese is rather performative as opposed to deep um, uh, integration of each other's navies, capabilities, intelligence sharing, uh, and sharing about maritime awareness, domain awareness, etc. Uh, so we're there. Japan's in a good place now. It continually, it's going to need to continue to invest um, to create the deterrence capabilities that it needs. Um, but I think its quality and performance will be uh, increasingly wed to its networks uh, and security partners that it's continued to deepen relations with. Yeah. Um, I'm glad you brought up Camp David. It was the next thing on my list. So uh, this is, I've had a pretty good year in terms of my forecasts and predictions. Uh, this is not one that I'm particular, that I have, that I've done well on. Um, my, my analysis was that the South Koreans would generally over the long term orient more towards China than they would towards Japan. And maybe on the long run, uh, <laughs> that forecast will bear out, but it's certainly not going to be in the short term and not in the medium term either, it seems. Um, you know, we've gone from a Japan South Korea trade spat just a couple of years ago to this new Yoon government um, taking over in South Korea by a fairly narrow margin. But now, you know, Japan and South Korea making nice at the economic level. Uh, Yoon pushing, as as you mentioned, military cooperation in some ways with Japan. Right now, the United States has a bilateral with Japan, a bilateral with Korea. It looks like the Biden White House, and this is quietly, I think, one of the Biden administration's biggest successes. That nobody's talking about trying to build a trilateral relationship between Japan, South Korea, and the United States, rather than the United States linking these two, bila- two bilaterals. Many administrations have tried to do this. Biden White House seems to be making some progress here. Um, how sustainable do you think this is? How resilient do you think this is? If, you know, as I said, Yoon won by a fairly thin margin. If you got a new South Korean government that was more like the Moon government, do all these things get jettisoned? Do we go back to comfort women and all these other things that happened when the Moon government came in power? Do you think there is a real strategic systemic shift happening? I realize some of this has to do more with what's happening in Seoul than what is happening in Tokyo, although Tokyo was the one that started the trade spat not so long ago. So talk to me about what you're seeing in terms of Japan-South Korea relations. Um, so I, I'm going to give you a, a story. Before the pandemic, I was in South Korea in December 20, uh, 2019. You know, I, I spoke to people on the political side, and um, I asked, "Who do you think is South Korea's uh, biggest threat?" And they said Japan. Uh, and then I spoke to people in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Defense, and they said uh, China. So there was a huge gap in terms of a politicized view about Japan and a more empirical or, or objective view about long-term challenges within the region. And I still think that tension exists. Um, but the UN administration 
um, is in line with, I think, the, uh, the more objective empirical approach to understanding the challenges within the region. And I want to say that I think that China is a challenge, but it's also a huge opportunity. And the countries in the, in the, in the region benefit from, from China's and China's economic engagement. Many of the, you know, the big ticket problems that are going to be faced in the region, climate change, uh, rising sea levels will require a Chinese partner. And I think they recognize that. The problem is, is that some of the current uh, red lines the Chinese are pushing are really not in the interests of South Korea or Japan at all. Um, I mentioned that story because I think, again, the sustainability of Yoon's uh, policies towards Japan uh, will really depend not only on um, his great leadership and the, the fantastic speech he gave at Liberation Day on August 15th. And if you haven't read it, um, I really encourage you to read it or put it in the links for your readers or your listeners. Um, he talks specifically about uh, the past with Japan, but the importance of working with Japan moving forward. Um, I think the role for Japan is to find ways to address some of the issues, uh, the historical issues between the two countries. And they don't necessarily have to do this bilaterally. I think Japan could uh, improve the situation by unilaterally adopting um, a more transparent uh, and um, uh, honest view of its colonial experience in uh, in Korea, and including this in the education stream, which is a public recognition of Japan's imperial period. Uh, I think these kinds of initiatives may uh, help you or help the South Korean people understand that Yoon's initiatives are actually bringing some closure to a very painful past between Japan and Korea. But here, I think also um, countries like the United States, Australia, Canada, where I'm from, Germany, France, UK, they have to be out there talking about the importance of uh, Yoon's initiatives and how these countries support it um, to uh, demonstrate to the South Korean people that um, Yoon's vision, although not popular, seems to have garnered a lot of international uh, support because they understand it is the right choice to um, create, you know, uh, a better international situation for South Korea to prosper in. Um, the last, I think, area that I think we can work with Japan and South Korea to, again, demonstrate to the South Korean people that these strategic choices are the right choice is to ensure that South Korea is on the table uh, and at the table for every single multilateral, multilateral agreement that uh, uh, discussion that's out there. And I think um, we've seen already the start of that. Um, the G7, uh, uh, President Yoon was invited. Uh, he was invited to the Quad discussions. We've seen the Asia Pacific Four NATO um, cooperation where South Korea is at the table. Um, I think that these opportunities to demonstrate that Yoon's vision of a global um, pivotal state uh, that's cooperating with Japan and the United States is going to be really, really important in terms of uh, creating the kind of political capital that Yoon needs to uh, make his policies sustainable. Um, the more of the support that we can give, the better. Uh, and this will take a lot of um, adept public diplomacy by friends of both South Korea and Japan. Um, which sort of leads, before we get away from the Korean Peninsula, um, is North Korea Japan's biggest threat? Is it more of a threat than China? Is it less of a threat than China? Do they really need to worry about what's happening in, in Pyongyang? I mean, uh, it, it seems like that's the one real wild card that you really can't, uh, like J Japan's approach is not going to work uh, with North Korea. So uh, North Korea is pursuing what we call a saturation strategy. So it's producing, in terms of quantity and quality, enough missiles to overwhelm the anti-ballistic or theater, theater missile defense systems that the Japanese and the South Koreans and the United States have uh, placed in the region. And this is a big concern, because once they've got to the stage where they can overwhelm the anti-ballistic missile systems, that, um, you know, what will they do? Will they try to bully or use brink brinkmanship to, um, you know, consolidate their position or to... Uh, pursue a peace negotiation, or perhaps extort South Korea, right? So, uh, or Japan. This is a real worry, I think, from the Japanese point of view. Uh, what is the long-term strategy? I think they also worry that um, you know it will be a permanent nuclear state. I, I generally think it will be a permanent nuclear state. 
Um, mm-hmm. um, it, I don't see any uh, way to move away from uh, our giving up its nuclear weapons in terms of the current um, the, the current nature of the Kim regime. So from Japan's point of view, uh, it is a threat. It's a threat that is increasingly acute, um, both from this point of perhaps an intentional uh, conflict, but also what happens when they keep testing and there's an accident. You know, the missiles are launched over Japan. Uh, What happens if one of these fall on Japan? How do they manage this? So I think that it is an important security threat, but it's not the same kind of challenge that China represents. China is an economic competitor. It has a very different worldview about how the regional security architecture should evolve. Um, it is placing a tremendous amount of resources in terms of developing its military, but also trying to reshape the region's um, economic architecture through its digital or con- uh, digital economic initiatives to the BRI, um, through diluting concepts of human rights and rule of law. Um, uh, and democracy that are really the basis for um, how countries like Japan, so middle-sized countries, um, survive in the current international system. And this is, I think, why Japan puts so much effort uh, in its diplomacy to support what we call a rules-based order. They want to ensure that it's not a might-is-right Machiavellian approach to uh, international relations being the arbiter of how we engage in foreign affairs, but a rules-based approach where we obey a a common set of rules, whether we're a small, medium, or large country. Uh, And in that sense, I think uh, China um, is a much bigger challenge for the Japanese. Yeah, and you're also sort of underscoring why Japan probably took such a dim view of Russia's war in Ukraine, plenty of other reasons too, but they're another tangible reason. Um, Stephen, I want to be respectful of your time, but there's two more topics I wanted to hit before we let you go. The first is um, goes by. I seem to be uh, full of of, uh, of banal, trite uh, phrases today. The old, um, I think it's attributed to Mark Twain that history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. Um, I feel this in the way that Japan deals with India in particular, but also just South Asia and Southeast Asia in general. If you look at what Imperial Japan's strategy was in the 1930s and the 1940s. It almost seems like you're seeing that unfold right before us right now. And everybody's afraid of China and Belt and Road Initiative and, you know, China's the big bad wolf. But like when you actually start thinking about, well, who's actually making the investments? Who's actually building the infrastructure? Who, do, who are the Indians actually dependent on? Who are they talking to? Which connections are being made? Japan is sort of the answer to all of those things. And ironic that maybe Japan could build, you know, a bridge over to India in the same way that Germany um, via the European Union has achieved some of its goals, albeit you know peacefully and with the United States as a security guarantor uh, in general. So that's a very open-ended question. I'll let you riff on either Japan India or just Japan's investments in connectivity in general versus the Chinese, the role of Southeast Asia. Um, it just seems like Japan is is a major player here uh, for those who are actually active in the region. But when you look at the way that people talk about this in English speaking media, it's not there. It's, oh my God, China's running around and China's controlling everything. Whereas the reality is is starkly not that way in my experience. Absolutely. And if you look at surveys such as the Survey of Southeast Asia by the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies in Singapore, Japan is the most tr- trusted country within the region. The Asia China uh, uh, survey as well, um, you know, China's uh, trust in China is not there. Uh, we look at um, financial investments and financing for infrastructure connectivity within the region. Um, Japan is at the top. Uh, Japan, uh, its biggest res- uh, the biggest benefactor of ODA is India for 15 years straight. Uh, Japan continues to invest hugely in India because it understands uh, it will be a place of future consumption, of future production, uh, and that they don't have the nasty history that Japan and China have or Japan and South Korea and North Korea has. So you're very correct that they are... Um, building their uh, influence and networks through infrastructure connectivity, trade agreements, and soft diplomacy throughout Southeast Asia and South Asia. Um, but it certainly isn't uh, from a hierarchical position. It's one where they are uh, very sensitive to local needs. They uh, try not to evangelize rights and 
um, human rights or uh, democracy that they are mostly talking about shared norms and shared behavior and attempting to institutionalize this across the Indo-Pacific region because they understand that uh, Japan's national security is wed to um, Southeast Asia and South, South Asia's strategic autonomy, uh, their economic integration, and sharing the same values uh, and um, broader uh, vision of the region. And this is why we see them investing. And I think this contrasts with the imperial period where it was very top-down, hierarchical, and Japan looked down upon um, Southeast Asia and South Asia. And just to contrast to our Chinese friends, um, I think that, again, the Chinese continue to uh, prefer uh, uh, agreements that are non-binding, non-legalistic. They prefer to stay out of the human uh, rights and uh, uh, corruption issues. Uh, they are very much um, self-interested in how these relationships uh, benefit China. And I think that this is a fundamental difference, that Japan is building relationships of mutual respect, uh, mutual benef- and it's really mutually beneficial, um, and that they're investing huge amounts of resources to do that. Um, I'll get you out of here on this. Um, Canada is this is the source of the second most podcast listens for this podcast. So roughly nine to ten percent of the listeners of this podcast are based in Canada, have many clients in in Canada. Um, so it's nice to have you on from that perspective. And I just wanted to give you a chance here. Uh, maybe not necessarily to talk about your expertise in Japan, or you can you know do it through that lens, but to talk about just for a couple of minutes about Canada's perspective on the world and how you think about Canada's foreign policy in relation to a free and open Indo-Pacific and U.S.-China relations and things like that. Do you are you optimistic about Canada's role? Do you feel that Canada is as far sighted as say Japan is in strategy? Do you see change or stagnation there? What advice would you give for Canadian listeners for things that they should be looking for, watching for that are that are of particular interest to Canadians as well? And if you're not Canadian and not interested in this, you can turn off now. <laughs> um, thanks for um, asking a question about Canada. So Canada released its Indo-Pacific strategy uh, in late 2022. I think um, in most of the stakeholders within the Indo-Pacific itself, whether it's Japan, South Korea, Australia, uh, Vietnam, and others, really had a lot of questions about it. Um, what I often hear is uh, we have a schizophrenic approach to the region. Um, they don't understand the uh, progressive side of the foreign policy because none of the countries within the region really care about um, the cultural issues. They're wondering why there's a values are so pr- prominent within the, the policy. Um, and, you know, they're basically wondering... Um, what what do you really want to accomplish within the region? Uh, and I, I, I'm saying this in the most constructive way possible, and I'm using the voices of the people that I talk to within the region. There's not a lot of, um, I guess, understanding of Canada's Indo-Pacific strategy, um, but there's a lot of appreciation for the concrete initiatives that Canada's involved in. So there's something called Operation Neon, where Canada's involved in sanctions invasions exercises to keep ensuring that the North Koreans don't get the stuff they need to keep their economy going. We've seen Canada plug into the quad exercises. Uh, we've seen some joint uh, maritime exercises in the Sea Dragon 21 exercises. Um, Canada's role in the Comprehensive Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership in, in advocating for the inclusion of the UK mm. and potentially South Korea and maybe Thailand and others. This is really important for shaping the region's rules um, and focusing on intellectual property rights. So I think these are all great initiatives. Um, I also think there's been some real praise for the unique formulas to uh, work with the political entity of Taiwan. So there's some uh, initiatives to um, work with New Zealand, Australia, Japan, and Taiwan in terms of indigenous issues and environmental issues in the Pacific. And I think that these are creative forms of diplomacy that speak to Canada's comparative advantages. Um, But... Uh, we should be very realistic that I think we have a, a Canada has a credibility issue. We weren't a first, uh, um, a first choice in terms of partners for the Quad. We weren't a first choice member for the AUKUS. Even IPEF, the Indo Pacific Economic Framework, we were not part of the initial uh, negotiation, which suggests that um, our closest partners 
may not be taking the, the government as seriously as the government is taking itself. And then this is a concern. Um, I think that Canada needs to um, do a bit of a reality check on where it fits in the world, what is really its influence, and what is its comparative advantages that it has. And in that sense, I think you know Canada has a huge potential to be an uh, Indo-Pacific player in terms of energy and critical mineral security, uh, in terms of food security, and it should be leveraging those comparative assets to engage within the region to uh, support uh, those technological economies such as Japan, Australia, uh, or uh, South Korea, Taiwan, uh, and that will benefit Canada. Uh, and this is really, you know, it's my country, so I want to be constructive, but I think we need to be thinking much more realistically, pragmatically, uh, and um, with a with an interest based approach to engaging in the in the Pacific rather than a values based approach to engagement like Japan, like Australia, and I think like South Korea. I think a lot of Americans uh, are resonating with what you're saying about your own country there as well. If they're listening, uh, Stephen, thanks for being so generous with your time. Have a safe trip back to Tokyo, and I hope next time we get to do this in person in Japan uh, rather than having to do it over Zoom. So. Cheers and thanks for making it. That would be great. I'd, I'd, I'd love that. So thanks for the opportunity. And again, enjoy holiday and we'll be in touch. Thank you so much for listening to the Cognitive Dissidents podcast brought to you by Cognitive Investments. If you are interested in learning more about Cognitive Investments, you can check us out online at cognitive.investments. That's cognitive.investments. Uh, you can also write to me directly if you want at jacob at cognitive.investments. Cheers, and we'll see you out there. The views expressed in this commentary are subject to change based on market and other conditions. This podcast may contain certain statements that may be deemed forward-looking statements. Please note that any such statements are not guarantees of any future performance, and actual results or developments may differ materially from those projected. Any projections, market outlooks, or estimates are based upon certain assumptions and should not be construed as indicative of actual events that will occur.